right, our uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Dick Taylor, who is the uh, Chancellor Professor and, uh, of course, Director of uh, ISR, who will be uh, today speaking on the role of architectural styles in successful product lines. Dick. Sometimes I've been known as the style guy, so in the world of software architecture research, some people are known for doing architectural analysis, and uh, some people are known for doing uh, reviews and things like that. I've always been associated with, uh, with uh, styles. Um, some of you, uh, I'm sure, can remember the uh, C2 style of uh, years gone by, and that was just kind of the beginning of a real focus on, on styles. But my, my talk today is not about styles just because I'm the style guy. But I've been thinking more about uh, what it really means in the sense of success for software products. So the first thing I want to do, though, is change the title <coughs> um, from software product lines to software ecosystems. So ecosystems is kind of a, a, trendy, uh, a trendy word these days. But I actually think it, it has some meaning. And I think it has some very uh, special and kind of interesting meaning uh, 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 in the context of uh, business and making, uh, and, and making money. So let me um, begin by giving you the, uh, the punchline, the end. Um, so I'm going to hopefully make, uh, make two points. One is that a well-chosen, a well-designed architectural style is key to a successful product line or ecosystem. And then the second one is, but there's really some uh, uh, alligators in the waters out there uh, in the ecosystem world, in that when you have a multi-agency decentralized application, that things get uh, nasty and, and, and difficult there. So just as, a, as an example of a multi-agency decentralized application, think of any e-commerce uh, application. Uh, Any time you have multiple parties and there's exchange of funds and it's over the internet, you have to worry about security, you have to worry about trust, you have to worry about, about reliability. There's a whole bunch of things that you have to worry a lot about. In fact, those worries tend to dominate the design decisions in open, uh, broad-scale applications. Well, let, me, uh, let me unpack the title just, uh, just a little bit. So I start off by mentioning architectural styles as being, as being a key to success. Uh, there, there is a terminology war out there a little bit. Uh, so this is the definition that uh, we have in our uh, uh, textbook on software architecture. But an architectural style is nothing more than a collection of decisions. Uh, and those decisions are applicable in a particular context. Those decisions constrain what you can do. In other words, you have to work within the style. You can't uh, break the rules as you go. And the benefit is that if you play according to these rules, namely, if you apply the style in the context for which it was intended, and you play according to the rules, then you get a bunch of, of nice, nice benefits. So the benefits might be in terms of extensibility, or portability, or uh, uh, adaptability, uh, performance. There could be any number of benefits, but it's kind of like, in this context, this is what you're worried about. If you use this style, then here's the goodies that you get at the, at the end of the day. Now, to relate that word to other, other words that are current in the, in the literature, I actually have a little diagram here. I would say this is all the same concept, the concept of using things you learned through hard experience in the past that taught you how to solve problems in the future. Uh, it kind of fits on a spectrum from where I would put design patterns down in the lower left-hand corner to architectural styles, to architectural patterns, and then to domain-specific software architectures in the upper right. What the, <coughs> excuse me, the um, uh, axes on this graph though show are the scope of the, uh, of, of the uh, idea and how much application-specific knowledge is, is involved in, uh, in the use of these things. So when you get out to the DSSAs, domain-specific software architectures, Deep application domain knowledge is required there, and these are decisions that govern entire system, system structure. So let's talk about the next word in the title, which was success. And what success means for a product line, and especially for an ecosystem, can vary a bit. 
uh, for product lines per se, it's usually profit and decreased time to market. If you can pump out the next version of your product in your product line faster than your uh, competitors can, that's usually a good thing and it also usually means that you are keeping your development costs down because it should be the case in a good product line with a good style that the cost of developing the next member of the product is much smaller than developing the initial member of the, of the, of the product line. Uh, when it gets to ecosystems, then there start to be other definitions of, of success. Uh, some people don't care about money. What they care about is widespread use, how it builds a platform for other people to, to leverage. It might be adaptability. There can be a lot of reasons for, for success. So it's kind of yes, yes to all those. But let me distinguish now product lines and, uh, and ecosystems just a, just a little bit. Product line is, uh, is a term that's used in the business community. Does not always mean the same thing in the business world that it does uh, in, uh, in the world of software architecture. Because if you remember, um, uh, you know, there are some automobiles that they, they all have the same uh, label on the front. It's a Chevrolet, but some Chevrolets are made in South Korea, and some are made in Detroit, and some are made here and there. The badge of Chevrolet on there doesn't really tell you anything about the cars. In particular, there's not necessarily any uh, technical commonality between all the cars that are made by, by Chevrolet. Uh, but when I'm using the word product line, I'm talking about separate products that share significant technical commonality in their components and in their structure. So a fine early example of this was the uh, uh, Philips uh, television sets, their high-end TV sets. They did just a, a wonderfully good job of the uh, software product lines there. The iPhone family, uh, another example of a, a product line from a company where there's significant technical commonality across the, across the product line. An ecosystem, on the other hand, has this one major distinguishing factor. That is that there are multiple organisms, there are multiple agencies, multiple participants in this uh, application, if you can even call it an application. And these multiple organisms interact with the system as a whole and with each other. So just as some uh, quick examples here, um, think of Photoshop uh, for, uh, to, to begin with. I'll have a little more about Photoshop in a second. but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Adobe makes uh, Photoshop, but Photoshop is made with a particular architectural style that is designed and in fact has been successful in encouraging other companies, other developers to make plugins which can add value to Photoshop. So you buy the main product from one company and then buy additional things that plug into it from other companies so that you get a customized product for your photo editing manipulation needs. But these multiple organisms, namely Adobe and the other vendors, they have uh, kind of a symbiotic relationship. It's good for Adobe that there are other companies that add value to their product. And of course, it's good for the little guys that make the plugins that Adobe is doing this thing in an open way because that enables them to become players in, in the marketplace. So it's a, it's a good thing. But it's not always a completely aligned, happy, happy, smiley, smiley uh, occasion. Because if somebody, like Adobe for example, decides to change the fundamental way of doing extension, then all the external players who have a vested interest in the previous means of extension, they will resist that because it means new cost uh, imposed upon them that's not going to add any particular value probably in the, uh, in, in, in the near term. So there's a lot of great success stories for, for product lines out there. Uh, product lines have been around for a long time. Just some uh, examples here. Uh, as I mentioned, Philips televisions were, uh, were early uh, success there. The Philips medical devices uh, company has also done that. They have, uh, in, in one case, gone a completely different technical basis for their product lines than the televisions. But then uh, they brought some of the uh, uh, technical uh, uh, secret sauce from the uh, television side over to their side. Uh, Samsung uh, does this. Samsung has published a number of papers about their consumer electronic devices and how they share some uh, key technical uh, commonalities. 
Uh, automotive applications, the, I was going to say IFE, in-flight entertainment, but it's, I guess it's IDE, the in-drive in enter entertainment systems. But uh, the, the networking applications that are on uh, all kinds of cars, there's, there's some great uh, product line stories as well. If you're interested in, in this, uh, one thing that's kind of uh, fun to look at is what's called the Software Product Line Hall of Fame, which has been uh, run by the, uh, the SEI and the Software Product Line Conference uh, for quite a few number of years. The, the URL is up there, and they have a set of, I guess, 18, 19, 20 companies which have done kind of an exemplary job of supporting product lines and have uh, uh, put their secret sauce in the public, so to speak, so that you can see what were the, the means by which they, uh, uh, they achieved their, their success. I really want to talk, though, mostly about the rest of my time here about uh, ecosystems. And I want to talk through a couple success stories. So for my first example, I would say, is the <coughs> Apple uh, apps, Apple iOS apps. As you all know, Apple is sitting on a pile of cash, okay, a pile of cash. So I'm the style guy, right? So what do you think is the secret to Apple sitting on all this cash? What's going to be on the, on the bill here? And you know there's a bill coming up because this is Black Brothers. You guessed it, Model View Controller, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this is a quote from um, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, things that you get from Apple, that MVC is central to a good design for any iOS app or Mac app. Uh, a little further on in their documentation, they say the most important design pattern is, is MVC. Well, there's more, though. Okay? It's not just MVC. They explicitly focus on MVC. They focus on event notification. They focus on the use of their frameworks, which, which embody architectural style decisions, Cocoa Ports and the other ones. They have guideline books, the iOS Human Interface Guidelines, the Xcode SDK that you saw in Andre's talk this morning. These things all take a set of architectural styles and say, here, if you do it this way, it'll turn out swell. And sure enough, it does. So Photoshop I already mentioned, but I didn't mention what the architectural style behind the extensibility of Photoshop is. And now I have to limit this actually to Photoshop Lightroom because they've changed for the, for the main product. But what it says there is Lightroom is highly extensible. Its plug-in architecture allows third-party developers to create a huge variety of, of plugins. My next example is web services, but not all web services. I know this is a long quote, but it's, it's so good I couldn't resist including it. It says, the world of web services has been on a fast track to supernova ever since the architect astronaut spotted another meme to rocket out of pragmatism and into the universe of enterprises. But thankfully, all is not lost. A renaissance of HTTP appreciation is building and under the banner of REST shows a credible alternative to what the merchants of complexity are trying to ram down everyone's throats, a simple set of principles that everyday developers can use to connect applications in a style native to the web. Okay, Great book that teaches you how to build RESTful web, web services by Richardson and Ruby. And some of the style principles that they talk about here are direct derivatives from the REST architectural style, for which all of us can thank the gentleman in the second row here, Mike Fielding. Okay. So, thinking about product lines and, and ecosystems, I, I want to bring this back to, the, to the, this point that product lines are often single agency. Not always, but most often single agency. And the sex, success criteria are usually narrower. It's usually a smaller set. It's usually re, in, uh, reduced development costs, faster time to market, higher quality also, especially <coughs> initial quality of a second, second product. In ecosystems, though, it's multi-agency, and the success criteria vary a lot, from profit to visibility to reach to just coolness, which is how Facebook started out, uh, to mind share to functionality. There can be a lot of a lot of reasons. So, the examples for ecosystems are out there. You probably just didn't kind of think about it. Software ecosystems, from healthcare, e-commerce, <coughs> defense, space systems, power grids, and and so on. But since it's multiple uh, agencies, there's multiple objectives, 
not all of which are shared, not all of which are compatible, not all of which are benign. So it's how do you deal with this characteristic? Invasive species can be hazardous to public software. So styles going forward. Uh, styles remain a key element in product line uh, success. Uh, I'd say, why is this the case? Why am I making the point? It's because styles carry experience. They aid communication. They provide vocabulary for designers to talk. They speed design. They yield predictable benefits. This is all a good thing. And if you want the two-word moniker for what styles give you, and adherence to styles give you, it's conceptual integrity. And it's maintaining conceptual integrity of a system, which is the big stick that carries you, carries you forward. But what's the style? What are the styles for open, decentralized, critical ecosystems where you've got weeds, where you're being told to spray off the bottom of your boat before you, before you put it back in the driveway. So um, I obviously don't have time to talk about this, but the, uh, the particular avenue that uh, we're pursuing here is called the COAST, Computational State Transfer. Talked a little bit about that uh, last year, but the main point is it's for decentralized applications. That's the context. There are some uh, particularly, particular constraints that we uh, apply based on mobile computation, a whole bunch of things about communication. And where we are with it is uh, full infrastructure in place for evaluative applications. We're looking for people to explore ecosystems to uh, see if, in fact, it works or not. And uh, one of the ones that we're working on at the moment is uh, electronic healthcare records. Because if you think of healthcare as an ecosystem, again, <coughs> multiple agencies, multiple players, not all of them are benign, and there's money involved, so there's, there's issues there. Um, so we're working forward on that, but uh, I'd love to talk to any of you who would be uh, interested in exploring this kind of issue. So with that, I think I've got uh, three minutes for questions. Questions for Dick? So I have a question, Dick. Okay. Uh, so uh, where do you think ecosystems are going to go once we start to embrace these, say, uh, coast style uh, or coastful representations? What do you see as the future? The, the thing that uh, I'm most excited about, I would say, is feeling secure about the money in my wallet because uh, if I think of all the things that I do online, I bought all my plane tickets online for a long time. I do a lot of flying, that's a lot of money. Everything, you know, all my finances are essentially online. Whenever I buy something, I always think, what's that person going to do with my credit card between the time I hand it to them and the time I see it again? Um, it all kind of works out because there's some risk management in the financial system. but. Um, a lot of that, I feel, could, could really have some very negative personal consequences. Uh, worry about identity theft. If you've ever talked to anyone who's been a victim of identity theft, it's a huge pain in the derriere. Um, I think it just would make me sleep better at night. Any other questions or comments? All right. Yeah, thank you very much, Dick.